as an American, I demand to make money on the plight of this. That's yeah, when, for, that's foreshadowing. Am I foreshadowing? When does this stock go public? Um, that's what I need to know. Is Actually, pro- Geo Group, there's a, there's a couple different public stock options I can think of where you could uh, directly profit off of this. That's interesting. Yeah, I was joking, but you're right. There are, there. this information is probably very relevant. So Geo Group, do you want to tell everybody what they do? They're, they're a private prison contractor who runs many of the detention centers in the U.S. They proudly display uh, their signs outside of many detention centers than you and I have both worked in. Proudly until they change their, they've been through four or five different name changes at yeah. this point, I think. Yeah. Yeah, 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 something bad happens, rotate all the workers, change the name, proudly display, display the next sign. The new name. The new name. It's hilarious. Yeah, it's hilarious. It's like a wily coyote thing. It's like, oh, that didn't work. Okay, no longer Geo Group. We are now something yeah. else. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's it's a uh... yeah, and their stock tends to go up when more immigrants are detained. So they were they were doing really well uh, during the Trump administration, which though it didn't deport more migrants than the Obama administration, it did detain more. We were at all yes. time detain highs before COVID. <laughs> Just turn this into an investment podcast. Oh, based, absolutely. Based on human oh, sh- misery. Oh <laughs> shit, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> misery stock. Misery the misery stocks. stock 100. Oh, oh man. Oh, <laughs> my friend. My friend. That's w- we're going to have to make that. Yeah. Actually, I'm I'm going to do that. I'm going to come up with the biggest companies that okay. okay. You've heard it here first, and I'm looking at the camera and telling you this guy's coming up. Misery the- stock 100. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. All right, I'm a genius. I'm a branding genius. Yeah. But again, you'll do all the work. Okay, keep going. Recording from the awesome Frontier Tech Law Studios in New Haven, Connecticut, it's the 10 Billion People Podcast, where we talk about, in the most unorthodox way possible, about the issues of migration and global movement that are only getting harder as the world approaches 10 billion humans. Here are your hosts, Damian DeNoble and Eli McDonald. Welcome to episode six of the 10 Billion People Podcast. Today's title is Gated Communities and the Louis C.K. Corollary. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is going to be hot. Yeah. Uh, for those of you new new to the show, we usually have three parts. We cover some stories we find interesting, not necessarily in any particular order, but they're all related to the theme of our show, which is the movement across the world during a period when our population is rising to 10 billion people. How do we deal with it? Yeah. And then uh, we kind of have a main story, and today's main story is going to be um, a very, very sad one, I'm afraid, but you're going to want to listen to it because this is happening in our own backyard. Um, And this story is about force feeding and ICE detention, okay? And then we finish up after the main story. We usually do uh, a, a profile of somebody related to the show of an immigrant that is in some way well known that is related to to something in the show and eli who's that today we've got kalpana chawla amazing amazing person amazing immigrant from from india first indian woman in space first indian woman in space and first indian woman to die in space yes 2003 challenger tragedy okay so i'm super excited to talk about that and then the final thing is for those of you who don't know Eli compiles the notes. Okay. He researches the show. I read the notes and then I add in terrible jokes. Okay. And I make suggestions as to uh, media we should add in. And so Eli put this nice thing together and I said, you know what this needs more of this very serious script dealing with reverse migration, in Russia and uh, force feeding and ice and this wonderful Kalpana Chawla who died in the Challenger crash it needs more Louis CK. Mm. that's what it needs more of because i like him i like him a lot i'm not afraid to admit that i like him a lot i think he's hilarious and a and a and a good person so uh (laughs) i i like him um okay so um let's start with the news so the un year in review what's going on yeah this just uh just came out Ties up a lot of the stories we've been covering uh, in the first in the first five episodes, um, and yeah, and, and quite a bit more. Kind of puts a bow bow on top of some of these stories. The trajectory that we've been kind of noticing of um, the pressurization of of migration, the EU um, worldwide, really 
Um, it is backed up by the numbers. There's a new record this past year. Um, a record. New record of people displaced, people on the move. Um, the UN's reporting that 100 million people um, were displaced uh, in the last year, 21 to 22, or in, excuse me, in 2022. 100 million people displaced. That's up from 90 million in 2021. Um, Can we invest in that? That's like 12% growth. <laughs> Can I make money on that? I mean, I think that's what we're doing with this episode. Actually. Yeah. Or sorry, with this podcast. As an American, <laughs> I demand to make money on the plight of this. That's yeah, when, for, that's foreshadowing. Am I foreshadowing? When does this stock go public? Um, that's what I need to know. Is actually, pro- Geo Group, there's a, there's a couple different public stock options I can think of where you could uh, directly profit off of this. That's interesting. Yeah, I was joking, but you're right. There are there. This information is probably very relevant. So, Geo Group. Do you want to tell everybody what they do? They're they're a private prison contractor who runs many of the detention centers in the U.S. They proudly display uh, their signs outside of many detention centers that you and I have both worked in. Proudly until they change their. They've been through four or five different name changes at yeah. this point. I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something bad happens. Rotate all the workers, change the name, proudly display display the next sign. The new name. The new name. It's hilarious. Yeah. It's hilarious. It's like a Wiley Coyote thing. It's like, oh, that didn't work. Okay, no longer Geo Group. We are now something yeah. else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's a uh... yeah, and their stock tends to go up when more immigrants are detained. So they were they were doing really well uh, during the Trump administration, which though it didn't deport more migrants than the Obama administration, it did detain more. We were at all yes. time detain highs before COVID. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So, so that's an interesting episode. We can look at later what we should invest in as uh, as full blooded Americans to take um, to take some profit out of out of um, what's otherwise very horrible news. Okay. But let's keep going. Again, I'm not foreshadowing at all what we're talking about today. Let's keep going. Just turn this into an investment podcast. Oh, absolutely. Based, based on human oh, sh- misery. Oh <laughs> shit! That's amazing. Misery stock. Misery the misery stocks. stock 100. <laughs> Oh, oh man! Oh, <laughs> oh my friend, my friend. That's we're gonna have to make that. Yeah, actually, I'm I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna come up with the biggest companies that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, okay. you've heard it here first, and I'm looking at the camera and telling you this guy's coming up. Misery the, stock 100. Okay, perfect. Yeah, all right, I'm a genius. I'm a branding genius. <sighs> yeah, but again, you'll do all the work. Okay, keep going. Okay. A rich one, Hi. rich branding genius. After I put this together, okay. okay. Um, How does this break down? How does this? Yeah, break down? so there's there's some big big feeders um, in 2022 um, to the to these massive displacements of people. Um, Yemen is in its seventh year of a civil war. Can I stop you right there? Mm-hmm. You just banged your foot, and I can hear it on the mic. Mm, okay, you just did it. It went. It was like a boom. Like you're. Uh, mm. It was like an SS boot. Okay. Like All you right. are. I'm on it now. You're banging the floor. For, for for refugees hiding from the SS. That's what it feels like. Okay. Go on. All right. Um, it's a new record. 100 million people displaced um, in 2022. Eli's Jewish. He's not, he's not SS. He's actually Jewish. I am. I am Jewish. Technically, I'm 100% both. My dad's Christian. Can we can we talk about the fact that your brother took a, took a photo with somebody that's also Jewish? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is... <laughs> Emphasis on the ish. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, as many of you hopefully have been gleefully following over the last month, I guess, but the last two weeks mm-hmm. when the good stuff's coming out, yeah. um, our good friend George Santos. Yeah, um, which might not be his name, honestly. It's probably not his name. Well, it wasn't in Rio de Janeiro when he was um, yeah. Yeah. participating in drag shows. He was Anthony. Anthony. That's what yeah. was his middle name. Yes. Yeah, That's yeah. Right. Your brother yeah, ran into he's... him at a bar. Yeah, my brother... Uh, yeah, texted a picture um, with him at a bar. Said he uh, talked to him for about five minutes, and uh, they talked about dogs. He showed showed George Santos our family dog. She said uh, he said our dog was adorable. Was well, George Santos like I got one of those? Yeah, well, that's I mean one of the best stories is that uh, he stole like three k from uh, like a dying veterans dogs GoFundMe or something. That was yeah. that's one of the good stories that yeah. popped up. My personal favorite, uh, my family favorite. Um, is that he was a star volleyball player on his college team that right. he that he never attended or played on. Right, but, he was um, top of the class. Yeah, you should have seen him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but, but I love that. So I actually got to see a photo of your brother and this guy, and that's hilarious. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All, right, all, right. all right. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Anyway, <laughs> breaking down a hundred million people displaced. 
Yeah, so these these hundred million people displaced. Um, there's some big feeders to this. The uh, the Yemen. You know what the, the problem with George Santos is? <laughs> He's so much more interesting than the serious things going on in the world. He's so interesting. In fact, I can't even get through the first part of this podcast yeah. where we're talking about this very serious thing. And I just want to keep talking about him. That is a lesson in why we shouldn't have horrible but endlessly fascinating people as our leaders. Because what's that, what's that guy going to do for this program, for this problem that we're talking about of moving people? He's just gonna he's just gonna make stuff up. We don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. <laughs> that guy is derailing this entire show. Even though he has his own, uh, when all this was popping up, we talked about trying to tie him in through his through his. Oh, immigration I still think story. we'll be able to. I, I think it's going to come out that he is he has like some sort of insane non-status. You know that that crazy stuff's about to come out. Yeah, I'm convinced. Yeah. I believe it. Okay, because yeah. he's Jewish. Except so his for grandparents not. were born in Brazil, and so they fled Germany. Wasn't that also complete? Well, well see, they were born in Brazil, and uh, then they uh, fled uh. Germany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. For a second, I was like, "Wait, is he actually? Yeah, zero Jewish heritage. No, he's Jewish. Jewish, yes. Quotes on the ish. He identifies as a That's Jewish person. That's my favorite thing. Yeah." yeah. <laughs> all right okay yeah, we're gonna yeah. get back to this we can't be distracted and those of you listening we are being distracted now from serious news and that's what crap news does to you okay so uh go on in. yeah seriously seriously hilarious crap news um back these uh back these displaced um it's 100 million displaced people um Yemen, Syria, um, those are kind of two of the big feeders that are still in place. Um, Yemen, of course, the U.S.-backed war with Saudi Arabia. You, it's, it's, you can't even really call it a war. U.S.-backed Saudi forces are raining down um, you know, multi-million dollar missiles on communities essentially living in the Stone Age. 4.3 4. million people have been displaced in what is now a seven-year conflict. And again, this place ran out of water. We covered this in one of the first two episodes. Ran out of water in 2014. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I hesitated to, you know, say, uh, living in the stone age because that, um, stone age had water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's, it, it sounds kind of, flip. you, could, you it, could squeeze water out of stone age rocks, but yeah. all you can, uh, squeeze out of here are, uh, uranium depleted shells. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's um, worse is what I'm saying. Yeah. No, it sounds flip, but that's, that's what's going on. Yeah. Um, they're in the sand age. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, as, as, yeah. I mean, there's, there's constant problems with these U S weapons deals with Saudi Arabia. Yeah. They're just never big enough. Um, never big enough. They're ne they just, yeah, they're never big enough. So there's that, um, that's a huge feeder. Um, Syria is in its, it's 11th year, um, since civil war broke out, um, 5 million children I read, um, in that country have never known the country at peace, which is a poetic um, way of saying 5 million people, have, 5 million children have been born during the conflict. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So it's, there's massive, massive camps in, in Jordan. Um, 80,000 Syrians in this Zaatari camp, uh, in Jordan have, have called that home for, um, for over a decade now, a lot of them. Um, and then like we've covered in, in past episodes, um, the numbers of people trying to enter Europe by boat have more than doubled in the last year as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, you know, the rest of the numbers, you know, you got war, you have country collapse, you have imperial collapse, as we'll talk about today with Russia's reverse migration, actually right after this. Yeah. Um, you, does this count internal displacement? Well, these are, they, these are, wait, now it's displaced people, right? So these aren't refugees are they, or are they counting refugees and displaced no, people? No, these are, these are just displaced Okay. Just displaced so, people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, so the so the difference between displaced people and refugees, the displaced people are still within their borders. Not not internally displaced. Okay. So this is displaced. So this counts yeah, so, refugees so the, so and everybody people, outside the borders. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes, okay. Yes. I was just confused there. For yeah, a yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. I, I believe uh, the UN was tracking people who are displaced due to specific instances within their home country. So then, my question is: Do you know if this counts internally displaced people? Does it put displaced and internally displaced in the same category that's a good question I'm, yeah i'm not sure okay. i'm not sure i'd have to look back at this article okay so yeah. this is super interesting okay what do you think is uh 
name for me five of the greatest migrations in the 20th century. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, that's what a, what a, be, what a, what a bar a, question. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. so here's roughly speaking. Okay, roughly speaking, you have the Great Migration in the United States where African Americans in the South moved towards the North over a 60 year period around eight to 12 million people. Okay. You have, which is a, a euphemism. I will point out the great migration. Well, when, when you learn about that history, it's, there, there's a lot yeah. of people pushing back. On, Aren't they on, all euphemisms? Sure. But especially the, yeah. Running away from terrorism, great migration. They just yeah. have, you know, I don't know. That, I, I think that terminology is getting more and more, uh, pushback over the years. For, it's like calling the trail, it's, the trail of tears, the fun trail West. Yeah, or the like fun the, trip west. Yeah. the Appalachian Trail West or something like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And anyway, so the displacement. It's, it's, it's of, like singing yeah. Oklahoma. Yeah. It's like the entire Oklahoma musical. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Okay. 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 All right. Then you have uh, the partition, right? So partition in India, Pakistan, mm, mm-hmm. right? So you have an est- somewhere between 8 and 20 million people affected. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have. Uh, World War II, after World War II, you have uh, probably the greatest displacement definitely we've had this century. Okay. You have the World War I displacement. And then uh, what you're left with are, is just this period of the last 40 years where because of what we call micro-conflicts mm-hmm. and because of climate change, we have these giant aggregate numbers down. Right. Mm. So it used to be, you could point back over a hundred years and go, okay, okay. We had partition people moved, Soviet union collapsed, like a bunch of people moved back into Russia. Right. Uh, world war two happened. So a bunch of people got displaced. World war one happened. A bunch of people got displaced. Yeah. Uh, you have lynchings all across the South, right. And a sponsored white terrorist state. So a bunch of people are moving North. Uh, but what's interesting to me about this number is that I, you can't point to something over the past 30 years and go, oh, that contributed, or in the past year and go, gosh, that contributed 20 million. It's like Mm -hmm. Ukraine's contributing 5 million, Syria's contributing how many million, you know, continue to contribute how many millions? Four to five, four to five million in Yemen. Yemen, like, I don't even know what the hell's going on in Yemen. We just like, we're, again, it's in the sand age. And so you have all these micro ongoing conflicts and there's no like historical precedent where we say there's a start and an end date. Yeah. It's just continuing war. That that's what's crazy I mean, that's, to me about this, you know? That's my American experience as a citizen, you know, from my first like inklings of political consciousness was when we were first going into Iraq after World War One. Um so I have no experience of of this country not being at war, but most people in my generation After World War One? We went into Iraq after World War One? No, I'm saying this um Yeah. I'm saying my generation has no concept of not oh, right, of, right, right, of right. not being at war, even though most of us wouldn't yeah, we were consider the fact that we're at war. I'm just saying it's so dispersed. That's right. And we, so globally dispersed that there's right. yeah. So that's that's just kind of like a reflection of For what you're For twenty years Afghanistan just sort of happened. Yeah. We didn't care. And that that was the irony beyond all irons. Okay. Yeah. So so the point is that this hundred million feels like it's it's snuck up on us. Yeah. And if I'm looking to 2054, where we're going to have 10 billion people, I'm going to make a bold prediction. This number is going to keep creeping up on us. And right now we're at how many people were, we just crossed the 8 billion people mark, something like that, yeah. 8 billion people, right? It wasn't nine, was it eight? Eight, yeah. Yeah, eight, right? Eight billion, yeah. And so we're going to be about 25% higher than we are now. So, but those new people have, like, they're not, they don't have the same there's not a, the same amount of room for them as there was for the previous 2 million. I'm going to predict 300 million people displaced by 2050 mm. in these sort of ongoing conflicts, because I don't see a solution to these sorts of ongoing conflicts done with modern weapons. I don't see political will. I don't see the space for many of these new people who are coming to developing economies to you know, thrive there. So I just see more increased movement. Yeah. So I, I think we're at the start of something. We want to track this. I yeah. think it would be really important to track this. Okay. We can track it as part of our misery stock index yeah. project yeah. where, uh, I think if we do create the right portfolio of stocks, we can really profit off of this. And again, that's, just, that's not foreshadowing. I'm just kidding. That's foreshadowing <laughs> for what we're talking about. I'm not a terrible person. Okay. All right. Next story. 
uh, related. Okay. Well, a related story is that, that, you know, as part of this 100 million displaced, we have a lot of Russian men of fighting yeah. age, specifically of between like 18 and 60, because Russian men in their fifties and sixties, we know are being called to the front. Yeah. And so what's happening yep. here? Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's estimated that a million men in this, in this age range have left, uh, Russia since last September, September, um, 2022. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And there's these reports from, um, foreign policy, the, the report on this, the reverse right. migration. Okay. Right. Yeah. So from the Bosphorus straight, um, you know, in Istanbul all the way to the, the Chinese border, um, there's this hu the huge influx of like fighting age Russian men. Um, and it was, you're giving some background. We were talking before of kind of the opposite of this, that this is kind of a reverse yeah, this is this is why it's fascinating. I mean, it is me. a reverse migration, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the. Sure, yeah. sure. So you know, the, the, these men are, are from all over. Against their their fighting age, and as soon as they heard there would be conscription and call up, you know, they just kind of went for the exits. And one very distinct group of uh, men that have left are who call themselves internet workers. So these are men who have jobs on the internet with American, European, African, Chinese companies. You know, whatever it is. And it's like they can work from anywhere. So they are tend to be the most educated in fields like computer programming, yeah. fields where they have to use different languages for customer service support. And where they're moving into are regions that were traditional, you know, support bases on the one hand for for Russians. So places like Montenegro, places like, you know, my home base of Serbia, there's a huge influx of Russians in Belgrade, right? Mm. Um, but also to the former Soviet republics, right? They were part of the Soviet Union who gleefully saw the Russians pack up and leave, you know, yeah. in, in, the, in 1990, 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Yeah. And what's interesting to me about that is we've been talking a lot. In fact, we've been talking almost exclusively about people from less well-to-do countries, countries where things aren't good trying to get into countries where, where things are better, right. right? Whether it's from Burundi to Belgrade to Europe, or whether it's from Central America to the United States, or whether it's from, you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa into Italy, you know, whatever yeah. the perception is. Um, and here we have people that are highly educated internet workers, many of them, and they're going to less developed places because their citizenship has now become a liability. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is a new driver that we haven't talked about before. It's very unique. It's a country that's an advanced economy where you have highly educated workers who are participating in the global economy, who are having to move, not because they don't have jobs, not because they don't uh, think they can live in their country because the country's not doing well, but because their status as a citizen in that country has put them in direct danger by because that country itself is invading a neighbor. Right. 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 Super interesting. And so my question to you is what happens when the welcome runs out? Okay. Mm. Cause we're already seeing and the foreign policy article talks about this. We're seeing the negative impacts of this kind of immigration too. Right. Yeah. When it's people from poor regions moving to good regions, what do the politicians say? What has the far right been saying in Australia, Europe, the United States? Oh, these folks, you know, th this is the dirty mob. We're going to get overrun. The great replacement theory. They're bringing violence. They're bringing rapists. Yeah. Well, the talk around when uh, migrants from richer countries go to poorer countries is they're bringing inflation. Mm -hmm. They're trying to replace us because all of a sudden these guys, you know, might want Russian menus, right? They want to mm -hmm. reintroduce Russia. Russian as a dominant language in regions, which do speak Russian, right? From, from yeah. leftover from the Soviet days, but also have their own languages and have been developing their own culture. Right. And they're trying to exploit us. What happens when a Russian with a lot of money is using rubles, goes to Uzbekistan and starts like hiring like three or four service workers, right? And when the first stories start come out of, of abuse, not because they're Russian, but because just this guy just happens to be a shithead. Right. Right. And, and also lifestyle, I think this yeah. is, we're going to get into it in a little bit, but, um, aid workers in Greece, for example, all this tension started boiling up because, um, 
you know, rich young people were moving into these pretty small, quiet towns. They still want to party. They still want to, um, you know, live the lifestyle that they're accustomed to. Yeah. So just kind of different, uh, different tensions that, that arise when wealthier people move into, um, less, a- less affluent areas. Mexico city is an example. So yeah. Mexico city has been getting a lot of cover coverage in our hemisphere because, and this is an interesting story. We got to cover it. Like we got to find somebody that's down mm. there, but, um, now, uh, this is the difference, by the way. This is what we're talking about. This is the difference between immigrant stories and expat stories. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Uh-huh. When, when, you're, when you're coming from a rich country and illegally living in a, in a poorer country, you're, in a, yeah. you're, you're an expat. Man, yep, that's yeah. it. Okay. That's it. And so these uh, Mexican uh, city, so Mexican stories, stories about immigrants from the U.S. and other places going to Mexico City where... Rent is affordable or super interesting. Um, and, you know, I wonder what the views are on that. But but I, I've seen at least several stories that are not flattering. Yeah, the Brooklynization of, of parts of Mexico City. Yeah, yeah that's I've, right. I've read, yeah, I've read similar I, stuff. Yeah. Except it's not Brooklynization at all because it's so much more than that, right? It's like, and when you're talking about gentrification in America, it's one American culture replacing or subsuming another. Here, um, yeah, it's, here it's, a, it's a culture that is coming and creating a completely different space within a city. What it really is, is the China towning of Mexico city, except it's America towning. Damn. You know? Yeah. 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 And, and yeah. so, so that's interesting to me. Like when, when, when you have migrants that are coming with their own money and investment, um, that creates a different type of racism, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? That creates a different type of racism. So there's a different type of racism in the U.S. against Chinese nationals, I think, because of the amount of investment that they brought into communities. Yeah, yeah. You know, versus versus migrants. Uh, I'm talking about historically over the past, let's say, 70 years. You don't have to go back all the way to the building of railroads and things, which is a whole fascinating history about Chinese migrants. But past, versus migrants from Mexico who, by the way, have brought a lot of wealth to this country, Yeah. right? It's just, it showed up slower. Mm-hmm. It showed up slower. And so there's, there's you, you get these flavors of racism that are really different and that changes the policy conversation. So true. Yeah. You know, like a hundred million displaced persons. I'm going to bet when we said that, cause I sure didn't, my mind didn't immediately go to like computer program migres from Russia. <laughs> It didn't immediately go to, you know, I don't know, like expats who were expats because they were forced out of their own countries, but are, you know, living high and mighty, you know? Right. Right. It didn't go there, but it, but, but it should. So there, there's, there's different flavors in here. Right. It's a complicated picture. All right. Let's move to the next story and then we'll get to our main bit. Um, this is just a follow up. Uh, Greece is now prosecuting, continuing to prosecute volunteers who rescued migrants in the Mediterranean. What's happening there? And we, we've covered this, you know, in, in most of our past five episodes, but what, what's happening now with these volunteers? Give us a little. Yeah. So this, um, just following up in this story, on this story, it's um, bigger than I thought it was. When we covered it first, uh, we talked about two young aid workers who were um, caught up in this, and they are two of the defendants um, in, this, in this newer story um, that's emerging, but they're two of 24 um, the high court in Greece uh, just dropped espionar- espionage charges um, against two dozen of these defendants. Wow. I-, I forget if we actually got in. Just really quickly, it's interesting to <laughs> to go into where these espionage charges came from. Um, these these charges relate directly to these two that we talked about before. They were driving around um, a Jeep that they had bought from another NGO in Greece. They, too, are young these, gr- young women. Nonprofit uh, volunteers, young man, young woman. Um, one from I want to say the middle, the Middle East. I can't remember one from the Middle East. One from um, Europe. Mm-hmm. I'll have to look into that. Um, Europe, eh? Yeah, I think Spain. Was he from Africa? And the, she was from Europe. No, Middle East. How many kilometers? Um. <laughs> uh, how many kilometers? How many kilometers in a mile? Why? Oh yeah, let's hit me with the math again. Did you get <laughs> such an American? 
Yeah, from Kilometers Europe, in a mile. 1.7. 1. 6. 1.6. So close, yeah. 1.6. Damn, it's a hell of a win compared to my... It's, it's much better. Yeah. Yeah. Am I red? Yeah, so red. Good. Beat red. Perfect. Perfect. Beat red. I went to a Waldorf school. We talked. Math isn't my strong cert. Isn't my strong suit. That's your strong cert? It's my strong cert. Cert? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that the South? Do you blame the South or do you blame yourself? Uh, myself at this point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely myself. Yeah, it's my own fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, just to give a flavor of how ridiculous this shit is, the original espionage charge came about because two of these aid workers were driving around this Jeep that they bought from another NGO, and under the license plate that the NGO had on it, there was an old uh, temporary military tag under it. That the, so it, it used to be a Greek uh, military Jeep. So they're like, how are we possibly going to, you know, how are we going to hit these people with the book as hard as we can? You're driving, you know, you're uh, driving around a Jeep military vehicle espionage boom. Um, so that's so that's one of these charges. And this is because they had the gall to try and help these Mediterranean migrants and they're getting hit with this book. Yep. Yeah. The other piece of it was they're that's saying insane. they were using uh, Greek military radio channels when in actuality they were just flipping through the channels to get to their NGOs uh radio channel so by flipping yeah it's like that that's the level of of crap that they're hitting these um aid workers with um and while they did drop these espionage charges and i think like wire fraud another big one um there's still human smuggling money laundering um and a whole bunch of other charges that they're um still trying to stick them with so it's an ongoing investigation for these 24 people um so so this is a warning case it's saying hey don't mess with our sovereignty yeah yeah i mean it's i mean i think if we look back to when this first kind of really started grabbing people's attention in europe um and the the numbers in the mediterranean really started to rise greek uh greece was really um the epicenter so i think this is really interesting looking um they they may this may be a sign of what's to come with other nations who are initially accepting help from um foreign workers and then um yeah big old backlash um, you know, we, we saw some of this in the U S for sure. And we've talked about this before, but you know, we, we did see a lot of, um, what we call here activists with, the uh, with asylum seekers at the Southern border, we put on no fly list and a few were actually prosecuted or long same charges. And that's, that, that's a story we could look up. I mean, yeah. we could bring some of that on board. There's, yeah. I, I almost included that too. There's, um, some of those people are now getting around those charges by saying it's um, their actions are tied to their religious beliefs, which is really interesting. People who are leaving water and food out in the desert um, yeah. to save lives. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing also. Um, are they Native American-ish? No, no. No. I think it was this... No. Uh, no. Yeah, it was... Uh, I forget his name. He's because a, that, that was the first kind of religious exemption for drug use was that... Um, were, the, were the cases about that one Native American tribe that could use peyote? Yeah. Right. That yeah, was because that, 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 that would be, I bet you that's got to be in, in one of the arguments, like those kind of, because that's the bedrock of any kind of religious freedom yeah. argument to exemption. But I forget what those. We should uh, look into that. Yeah. We should. We should yeah. be, we should be actual lawyers. Okay. <laughs> so, so here's, you know, what I um, mentioned that part of the title of, of this episode is the Louis C.K. corollary. And so we look at the prosecution of these volunteers. And we think about all these displaced people and the fact that it's really hard to find a landing place, particularly to find a landing place if you're poor, Mm -hmm. right? And the poorest people on earth tend to be browner and you're trying to come to places that are richer, which tend to be a little more pale skinned. Um, And uh, what happens is that uh, it makes it, the richer countries make it really hard to come in, right? And if you try to be be a hero and, and help folks navigate that, system which is purposely complicated purposely has very thick impenetrable bureaucratic procedures that you have to go through well then you can get prosecuted so the answer is like why that seems like such a bizarre set of actions to be taking part in when we know that these people are suffering that they're dying it it seems really bizarre to be happy to let people die in the name of security and so uh, 
which it's a really weird concept to kind of wrap your head around. So here's what Louis CK on a recent episode of the Joe Rogan podcast had to say, see if I can cue this up. And, uh, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this. You're happy when you're, you're secure. Mm. Um, you know, like people, I was really listening to something about the border. You know, these, these people just trying to come into America. And some people are like, well, if we let just a few in, it's a mess. Like, there's right. no good answer, you right, know? Right. What if we just let the ones in who are really upset? Yeah. Or, but we can't let them all in. Like, when liberals try to say, it's like the dumbest position they get into. It's like, well, we can't, no, we can't keep, let them in here. Got to keep them out. But we really like them. And it's great that they're brown and sorry. But, you know, there's like an impossible, and then, they, and then the right takes over, and they yeah. sound racist, and then the left takes over, they just sound stupid. But my feeling is they should open it, the border, and just let them pour in, let everybody pour in, and, and then the answer, which is, well, then there will be all these problems. Yes, there should be. It shouldn't be so great here, is what I'm saying, in America. It shouldn't be. It's a weird thing to sequester a certain group of people and try to keep upping their lifespan and their lifestyle and just keep trying to increase that for this group of people. And then everyone's, and then this pressure of people trying to come in so they can enjoy it. Uh, and then it gets worse and worse down here. I mean, I'm not Canada. The, the, <laughs> it's really just from down here. Uh, there's something wrong with that. That's not a system that's working and it. Okay. Super interesting for a number of reasons. What do you, what do you, what do you, when you hear that, what do you think? There's, there's so much that pops into my head. The, the imagery of kind of the king of the hill mentality of sequestering um, a population of people um, and just the, the impossibility of it and the, um, on, both, on both sides. They're, they're, yeah, and, and then just the, yeah, the zombie movie Im imagery also, like willfully trying to create a world in which um, rich nations are surrounded by, you know, human meat grinders, like I said, in, a, in another, in another episode. Um, and then just, yeah, the, where his point, where I really think I need to sit down, like think about his point, um, more deeply is like, it doesn't even work for the people inside. It just sucks more and more like gated communities suck. They all, they're terrible for, for so many reasons, especially for the people inside them. It's the same thing about, um, you know, it's it's like the concept of saving up and buying some, you know, Mick Mansion in the middle of Texas for like four thousand dollars, and then you know you never see your family anymore because there's forty seven rooms in the house. You know, it's yeah. So it, it brings a lot uh, brings a lot to mind for me. What does what does it make you think of? I think I'm thinking along the same lines. What what I love about this is that Louis C.K. flips the Great Replacement theory on its head by challenging its core assumption. So the great replacement theory, the, one of the bedrock principles, along with the 14 words of a lot of kind of racist rhetoric around immigration here, Europe, Australia, really the West writ large, but we also see it. You go to South Africa, uh, if you go, if you go to parts of Russia, if you go to China, every, everybody has a version of this. Yeah, so I don't yeah. want to just say, but the idea is that we're going to be overrun by these hordes, unwashed hordes of people that are coming into our country unabated. And for that reason, we must up security. We must kick all foreigners out. We must be merciless. We can't let our bleeding heart kill the entire body. Right, right. Louis C.K. says, okay, but that assumption, that, excuse me, that principle rests on an assumption I just don't agree with, which is that everything in our gated off country is really nice and we're all happy. And therefore, because that's true, if we let all these people in, they're going to mess it up. Well, I think that he goes, I think that our reality is that we've created a system that makes us really unhappy. And that uh, we're part of the reason we're really unhappy is number one, because things are too easy in some ways, right? Yeah. But we're also just morally compromised all the time and we know it. And we know that our phone, our iPhones get built by under slave, under slave conditions, right? Yeah, in, yeah. in factories. We know that the reason that certain things are cheap here is because people in like, uh, you know, they mentioned this podcast, but like people are cobalt mining for dimes, yeah. you know, we know that, 
uh, by keeping prices down in our country, you know, uh, that in order to keep prices down in our country, to keep consuming cheaply, somebody somewhere is paying the price with their blood and toil, right? That is, yeah, that you is know, such a good point. We all have to like choose if we're trying to be informed and, and trying to think about what's happening in the world. We essentially have to choose what outrages us and choose what we emotionally connect to. And I don't know about you, for me, that choice alone depresses the shit out of me. Like, like sitting there and deciding what's, you know, what's like just right for me to, to really care about. That's you know, right. Like that choice itself is a deeply depressing thing. That's so, right. But it's also necessary. It's also, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. And, and so, well, th that's right. And so, but what that leads to is this, it's like, so the choice really, if we want meaning, we should create more disorder. Okay. The disorder has been the lifeblood of this great country anyway. Whenever we've yeah. had periods of immigration, the wrong thing to say actually probably is immigrants made America great. No, the fuck they didn't. Those immigrants were good. It was the act of creating the chaos that immigration did bring on for short periods mm. that made us stronger, right? Yeah. We learn new skills from each other. We learn how to get along. We are the, we are the undisputed leader in this country in things like Nobel prizes, innovation yeah. for a reason. And we learn to build a government that functions with big groups of society that don't get along. Like yes. this is one of the big things yes. um, in today's day and age that bugs the shit out of me. We're not supposed to agree on everything. Like we're functionally not supposed to agree on everything. Yes. And I think that's where like the, a lot of the strength and flexibility uh, came from in our, yeah, from, from these groups of immigrants. But, that's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. And so when he says, uh, He's not advocating for open borders, right? His argument's different than that. He's not saying open up the borders, get rid of immigration restriction. He's saying we need to do something that gets rid of the moral quandary we're in because that's making us sick. And we need to get away from this idea that we need to make everything so seamless, so freaking easy for ourselves at the benefit of everybody else. And an illustrative way to do that, right, is to is to paint this picture of the gates open and everybody floods in. His whole point is, in essence, then, make things fucking more complicated. By trying to make things less complicated, having the perfect merit-based immigration uh, policy, uh, having the perfect balance between caring about people, especially the people who are really have it really fucking bad, and not letting people in. That's crazy because it's all born of from the same flawed assumption that we can protect ourselves from the rest of the world in this gated community and still be good. You can't have both. So lift up that rock from your heart that we can have it good at the expense of everybody else and start from that assumption. That's what he's saying. Yeah. That's what Louis C.K. is saying, and I call that the Louis C.K. corollary. So the Louis C.K. corollary, simply put, is get rid of the assumption that we can build a society based on the exploitation of everybody outside the gates. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a really good starting point for how to think about a world of 10 billion people and what we're going to need to do to make it work without killing everybody. Because the other thing about this is if you insist on gated communities, then we're just going to keep killing everybody that tries to get in. Yeah. And at some point, if there's nowhere to go, cause there's less land, things get bad. The inevitable result is death unless we change our assumption. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can't have a gated community if there aren't people outside of it, you know, so Say that thing you said earlier, not at this podcast, but you said something super interesting. You had something very Zen, which is like, if we get rid of the, the fear is if we get rid of the gates, you said. Yeah, it, it came back to um, a Chris Hedges book that really changed my life. Um, War is a force that gives us meaning. The essential yeah. idea being um, a common enemy, especially on a national scale. Um, there's nothing more powerful to create identity and meaning essentially um than a common enemy an idea of what your shared enemy is 
Um, so yeah, that was kind of in my mind thinking about um, Louis C.K.'s point. And yeah, regardless of where you fall on the, on the political spectrum, the arbitrage disappears if you just let everybody in. If, if the border doesn't exist, if there aren't people who are more immiserated than you, then your identity completely disappears, essentially. Let me, let me reset it. Without yeah. doors, we cease to be. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it is the idea of arbitrage that you talk about, that by creating borders and nation states, this all, this all is, is organically created. And, and that a lot of these conflicts uh, don't exist without, uh, without the door, without the border. And so here's, here's something that we can draw from that too. I think it's true. If you get rid of the doors, we as a country cease to be what we are. We become something completely different. And what political discourse across the spectrum doesn't acknowledge is that great change is inevitable. The right mm -hmm. says we can keep batting down the hatches. We can keep batting down the hatches. And in fact, we must bat down the hatches harder and we must kick everybody out. And not only we're we not going to change, we're actually going to not change so much that we're going to look the same that we looked 70 years ago. Right. Right. It's the, it's the nostalgia fallacy of the right. Exactly. The left says, uh, no guys, we can open the door completely and it's all going to be fucking great. It's all going to be kumbaya. We can figure this out. We have the systems in place. We just need a technocratic solution. We just need to open our hearts. Meanwhile, we have a 2 million case backlog. The asylum system is worse than ever. Yeah. And Everything's suffering. The politics have gotten worse. It's like, no, there's going to be change. Yeah. You have to prepare people for that and be honest. Yeah. Right? Now, the change is going to come in one of several varieties. If you keep batting down the hatches, just know the interior of the country is going to keep changing over time. It's going to change slower. Yeah. But where the change is really going to happen is on the battlefield in front of your gate. Mm -hmm. That battlefield is going to get bigger and bigger, and you have to be honest about that. Yeah. The more you secure the hatches the more people you're going to have to kill and deter and the more resources you're going to have to put into it. And it's going to become like a virtual standing war. Right. Right. If you open the doors completely, then the entire character of a nation is going to change. And so the question becomes, are we ready? Are we willing as a nation to continue to be what we always have been, which is flexible in the pursuit of, the destiny, the manifest destiny of the American dream. Yeah. I'd love to see a good pitch for that. Yeah. I mean, not to get too deep in the weeds with this, but, um, are you going to tell me manifest just, destiny is racist? No, no, no. It just, uh, heat it's, check. it's whether, you're, like, you're like heat check. Heat <laughs> no, check. no, 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 yeah. it's, no, it's, it's, it, it all comes down at this point, I think to kind of a fundamental disagreement about what that, um, what that manifest destiny or what that, uh, what that character actually is and whether American exceptionalism is like a static thing or not. You know, I, I believe in a degree of American, you know, it's like that famous Langston Hughes quote, you know, um, I believe in the America that never was, but that will be that thing. So I believe in an American exceptionalism of that. I believe in our promise of like what we could be but I think it's a static thing and that we've moved closer to that um, when we're pushed, when things are difficult, like we were talking about, when, when things are um, a little more chaotic. And I think the American exceptionalism that's uh, more mainstream now is something that's static and that's something that can only be threatened by, um, by incursions, not strengthened by it, if that makes sense. And that makes sense. That's, yeah. But you know what it also does? If we allow for the fact that there will be incursions and those who advocate for opening allow and are honest about the fact that there will be change, we bring a lot of things into the light, right? I, I think whenever we're talking about subjects politically, you're doing two things at once. You're on offense, you're trying to get your point across, mm -hmm. and you're on defense, you're trying to hide the things that cut against your point. Mm -hmm. And ironically, what gets hidden a lot is the violence 
Yeah. Not just outside of the gated communities, but within. Yeah. Right. And so that's what our main story is about here. Um, and this is why, you know, we named, um, we named this what we did. You know, we, we are really comfortable. We are, we're really focused on being comfortable in the U S and the rich countries and fine. We're really comfortable, but there are a lot of people actually within our society, within actual walls that live in our communities who are going through hell through the types of things that we don't think exist here because we think we've created the gate and left all of this outside. Yeah. The irony is, as we'll see in the story as we've covered before, when you set up the gate, the sort of, uh, mutations mm -hmm. that are created in the national character because of that gate, because of all the death that happens outside, they do creep in. Mm -hmm. They do creep in. Okay. And, and again, the Louis CK corollary, right? The Louis CK corollary here. Okay. So what's, what's our main story here? Force feeding and ice detention. Yeah, this is, this is a really intense story. And the, the thing to realize right off the bat um, is that this story happened in 2019 um, and that the story here is this video coming out. This is the first time, um, well, I guess another small back piece of this is force feeding happens in federal detention, criminal um, and immigration detention all the time. Why? Um, well, what's it in response to? It's, re it's, it's basically in response to prisoners getting to the point where the only power they can exercise is um, like autonomy over their literal body, hunger strikes, things like hunger strikes. Um, and it's, yeah, and we can get into this a little later further down, but it's a, it's an interesting thing. It's like, are these um, federal, federal agencies, are these private um, prison contractors, are they supposed to let people starve themselves to death? That's, the, you know, that's difficult. And, and they would say, no, that's not an option. So we're, you know, we're doing medically necessary uh, procedures to keep these people alive. So that's, that's their line. But yes, so basically this, this happens in federal detention um, a good amount. And um, this is just the first time that an actual video um, has come out of it. Um, and it was in November 2019. Um, this man, uh, Kumar, uh, was in, he's an Indian man. Um, he is a, what you would call a legal immigrant. He, he came to the U S immediately turned himself over, um, to authorities and claimed political asylum. He said he was facing, um, imminent violence and death in his, his community because of his political beliefs. Um, and he tried to do this the right way. You know, he tried to come um, like many people in his position. Um, he was thrown into detention uh, moved around to a number of different detention centers. I believe this actually took place in New Mexico, um, where he was uh, um, eventually transferred. Um, but as his case was being adjudicated, he was detained for about a year. Um, mm. and Which is common. Which is very common. Um, Again, not a criminal, civil detainee. Exactly, exactly. And like I, we've probably mentioned this before, you can't mention it enough. Uh, these detention centers at best are indistinguishable from, um, from normal prisons. Um, really they're indistinguishable from, from supermax prisons in some cases, um, from what I've heard, um, where detainees are dressed in different colors based on, um, their offenses, e even though, you know, this, like we said, this is technically not a criminal offense, uh, to claim asylum. Um, they're usually chained up, uh, Sometimes hands and feet, often just hands um, walking to and from, you know, a courtroom to their, to their cell or to a common area. Um, and most importantly, what comes out in this area um, is these places are run by private contractors. So they're not run by federal employees. Um, GPS, Global Precision Services, I think, was the... Um, was the private prison corporation that was uh, responsible for his force feeding, for Kumar's force feeding. Um, and it's another big, big piece of this um, is the use of solitary confinement. It comes up over and over again. Um, Roy Lynn, who we talked about last, last episode before he committed suicide um, in ICE detention, Louisiana, was kept in, in solitary for, um, 
Do you remember how long? It was many months for him. I think it was mm. uh, two and a half months total or something mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and the story is the same here with Kumar. Um, you know, so he's he's a non-criminal. He comes, tries to do this the right way. Uh, months, weeks, months go by. Um, he, you know, he's in one of these ICE facilities that is constantly trying to cut costs. It's a it's a private business. Um, conditions are horrible. Um, like I talked about, witnessing firsthand in some of the Louisiana detention centers. Um, a big thing comes up with him because he asks. Um, he asked the Otero, it was Otero, um, Otero maybe, Otero, New Mexico, where he was being held. Um, he asked if they could stop cross-contaminating um, his food with beef because he and a lot of other Hindi um, detainees, it was um, you know, against the, the religious observations. Um, so for insolence like this, he was just thrown into solitary again and again. And insolence um, here is in quotes. That's... that's um his records actually that that's in the notes that he was confined because of quote insulin. Exactly. Unquote. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. I was, I was saying that facetiously. Um, yeah. Asking for his food to not be cross contaminated. You, you've um, correctly used the word facetiously. Can I tell you my pet peeve for the word facetious? It is overused. No, no, no. Can I tell you my pet yeah, peeve? Yeah, though? What is it? It's when somebody completely unfunny, usually a dry professor, usually a libertarian says something that's not funny. Like a, it's like, but it's like, clearly they wanted it to be. Yeah. And then they go, I'm just being facetious. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, no, no, you're trying to be funny. Yeah. You're trying to be funny and, uh, you're afraid because nobody laughed that we thought you were serious. And so you're mm. aware of the fact that the joke didn't land. And so, uh, now you're going to use a big word to, uh, wrap it up and get back into what you're good at. You're using big words, you fucking dweeb. <laughs> But, but in your you could, case, you, you could have just said that to me. I, I would have been were, able to handle but it. In your, no, 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 not you though. <laughs> but you, no, no, that wasn't a joke. You, you were just, you, you, you were on a rampage there of just, just being just like angry for this guy. Yeah. And you know, you're using their words with, with the right thing. And he's like, I just want to commend you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you're you. Welcome, man. Yeah. So this, um, like I talked about last time, yeah. the, the solitary bit. Um, always just hits me really hard. I've I've seen solitary drive people insane in like a matter of weeks. You know, I I personally believe that it's it's torture in in most cases. Yeah. Um, and especially if you, I think I think billions of COVID isolated people believe you. Yeah, yeah. And I was gonna say especially. I don't know especially, but especially if you're if you're not sure why you're in there to begin. You know, yeah. If, if it's been you know eight nine months for this guy. Um, Andrew Tate has been in solitary for like a month. Andrew Tate, the, uh, yeah, yeah. the Romanian rapist. Yeah. Influencer. And, uh, people are like, oh, maybe we should get him out of uh solitary. But there's like, that guy like probably trafficked people, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Allegedly. Yeah. And this guy has for political asylum. We put him in there for 11 months. Yeah. You know? And just, it's, it's silent, but this video is coming out. So what's in this video? Yeah. So I, I watched, uh, this entire video. It's about an hour long. Um, and can I just tell something to the people here? Yes, please. Camera one on me. Eli's recently, which is cool, (laughs) but his beloved is, is not currently with him here in Connecticut. She's elsewhere for school reasons. And so most guys in that position would take it easy. They'd uh, get some extra chips. They'd eat horrible dinners, eat burgers, you know, go hang out with friends, you know, do all the stuff <laughs> you want to do when your wife is not at home, you know, you know, but this guy's like, oh God, I got some free time. You know what I'm going to do? Uh, I'm going to watch and make sure I understand fully emotionally and mentally uh, the torture of this immigration prisoner so I can become a better advocate. <laughs> That's how you know you're a hardcore Future immigration attorney. Good Lord. Let me give you a, a vignette Good of, Lord. of me watching this video, actually. Please. So I was raised by uh, two old hippies. Yeah. Ate a lot of tofu. Yeah. No soda, yeah. et cetera. How'd you I, get fat, though? Yeah. Great question. I ate a lot of the freaking tofu. You um, did? Huh. Yeah. Um, I was a very chubby kid in middle school. You must have smelled amazing. <laughs> 
Uh, so I never discovered the joy of Uncrustables. Have you ever had those? They're those little like PB and J sandwiches where they cut the crust off, right? Oh god! Like four months ago, I discovered these. No. So uh, Eva left, so I bought like a giant pack of them, obviously. So I'm gonna watch this video. So I go make myself an uncrustable. I put it in the toaster. They're delicious toasted. <laughs> so I'm sitting there watching this hour long video. Within 25 minutes, I'm crying. So I'm sitting there crying into my fucking uncrustable. <laughs> uh. Yeah, so anyway. <laughs> so that's what I do when Eva leaves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she better marry you quick. Yeah, I know. This goes yeah, out. before this episode this comes goes out. There's going to be like a thousand just like <laughs> bachelors and bachelorettes knocking at the doors. Being like, yeah. uh, I'd like to I'd like to make him. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I grew up in the age of, um, you know, the early internet. I've seen my share of like beheading videos back in the early 2000s you did? and if not me i just watched pixelated porn <laughs> that's what i was into black and white pixelated images of pamela anderson pixelated yeah it's kind of like uh our computer was in the kitchen it engages you know? your imagination in the kitchen it was in the kitchen and there was like a little table to the side of me on my right and then in front of that table was our small living room with the tv and my parents would be there and i was just like uh I would I would edge the computer screen just a little bit, a little bit to my left, <laughs> and I, I would just like ten minutes. I would just wait for one photo <laughs> to download, <laughs> and then uh, then I would just like look at it and try to memorize it. Like close my eyes, just trying to memorize it, and then I would uh, hoping that my parents didn't get up and make the five foot walk over to where I was, you know. Because then you yeah. just would have to punch through the, yeah, just punch through the, the computer. <laughs> and then I would turn it off and I would go upstairs and I would masturbate. <laughs> that, was, that was how I did it at 13. It just like, try, but with the image, with the memory, man, people have no idea. Like people we have, have to no do idea. that extra step. And that's right. And then you imagine things into it. You're like, all right. All right. She's yeah. black and white. She's pixelated. But what if she starts moving? How does that? Okay. What does that yeah. Mean? So you were you were like one of the fancy kids with the fast internet. No, I didn't have like, fast internet. You had like a whole image download. No, no, no. Imagining in my head it was like it was it was like okay, all right. It was I said pixelated black and white. We both suffered. We both suffered. Wow. This is this is white <laughs> privilege talking. Yeah. So this uh <laughs> this has become a I, tough I had segue. Immigrant, immigrant internet. Now go on. We can segue <laughs> from masturbation back to the story. Go. On. Yeah. So all challenge. Uh, yeah, I'll bas- basically. Yeah. Um, Pamela Anderson I've, I've, was married to Croatian. Immigrant, really? Immigrant. Oh, interesting. So anyway, she was back just to, on NPR yesterday too, actually, which was really strange. Yeah. Um, well, so anyway, back to immigration. Back to immigration. Um, yeah, so seen a bunch of uh, really fucked up stuff on the internet. This this video was uh, really excruciating for, for me to watch. Um, all of these force feeding incidents um, are supposed to be videoed. Um, so most of them do have, it's usually like a handheld camera, um, from one of the, from one of the contract, uh, employees and they just haven't come out yet. So this is the first one that's ever surfaced. Um, so it's in like a really eerie kind of POV. Um, it opens up with these five correctional, you can't call them officers, they're Mm. contract workers. Um, standing outside of the room um uh, yeah so and they basically go one by one and say uh what their job's going to be you know i'm going to be holding the head i'm going to be looking for weapons i'm holding the leg um then they go into the room and kumar um ajay it's ajay 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 Mm -hmm. um he's i think he's about 30 days um into the hunger strike so he's incredibly um, frail looking, he's mm-hmm. lying on kind of this hospital gurney. Um, and yeah, so they surround him, um, each person on a limb, they also strap him down. Um, and then, yeah, it, it goes on, it goes on for, for so long. <laughs> um, they, they kind of give him a final chance. Um, I think I have, I, I can't find exactly what it says, but they give him a final chance and he, um, he basically says that if I continue like this, I'm going to die anyway. Um, you know, he's so, um, mm. he's so traumatized from his experiences in solitary. 
um, and his year in, um, you know, basically like the, the equivalent of a supermax prison, um, mm. which he just wasn't, ex- wasn't expecting, um, this, this is a long interview with him and he talks a lot about, um, his image of America, what he thought he would m- be greeted with when he came here, um, how he understood that he would probably be detained for a short time, that he was willing to go through that. Um, um, this obviously was much more than he, um, bargain for so so yeah so this is interesting yeah right so i mean all of it's interesting most all of it's horrific but what's interesting here is that the image of america is created from within the space of comfort that louis ck talks about this really comfortable space so you know we like to talk about our cars and we like to talk about all these different foods and we get big and fat and fucking love that and we just love fancy parties and we've invented Instagram and social media, you know, and that feeds into all this kind of false imagery, but beyond false imagery, we just, we are comfortable presenting ourselves as nice to the world. Yeah. You know, yeah. in return for profit, profit influence. Yeah. And, uh, that tricks people. Yeah. Because they think, oh, that's what I get to be in. Oh no, 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 no. You have to come through the gate. Yeah. At the gate and at the periphery, at the edges of our society, we're not comfortable. It's not comfortable. Yeah. You are not going to be comfortable. Yeah. And it's telling that this very comfortable country, most of it, has no idea that those places exist. Right. Or at least does its best to ignore them. Right. Or in its worst impulses, celebrates them. Can't wait for that guy to go get to prison. He's going to get raped. Prison justice. Damn Such right. a bizarre thing. Yeah. yeah. Such a bizarre thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Such a bizarre thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I, I feel like I've been trying to put kind of a perfect image to this, but there was something so deeply... Um, unsettling about just this this image if you can imagine it you know this is a guy who's run i'm holding his head i'm holding his legs yeah i'm gonna feed him yeah what just wait till i get to the actual feeding part but just you know this guy <laughs> trying to seek political asylum and do things the right way which you you hear all the fuck over the place now do things the right way and bad things mm, won't happen to you mm, anything bad that's happening mm. to immigrants is because they're trying to do it the wrong way do it the right this dude was trying to do it the right way by the book and all of a sudden <laughs> he is so traumatized by solitary and immigration detention that he exercises his last little bit of power and starts starving himself to death to try to get out. And all of a sudden he's surrounded by these probably minimum wage or a dollar or two above contract workers, um, holding him down to a bed and, uh, and these two ice nurses, um, shoving things down as nostrils. So they, there's a couple interesting, uh, little points here. There were like 40 other, uh, Hindi men who are participating in this. They had most of these men in the room where this was happening. So they specifically did this in front of a lot of these other hunger strikers, probably to try to um, scare the shit out of them, deter them from continuing. What? Yeah. 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 So it was done in the presence of all these other detainees in this kind of open room. Can you see them in the video? No, it's just on his bed. Um, but he. Um, but he's surrounded actually, maybe, by these other guys. You can. I. You can see another bed next to him, and I think maybe somebody's arm. I think you can see um, that there's someone in the bed next to him, but it's it's a pretty like close shot. It's like a POV camera, probably from one of the. Oh, that's so fucked. Um, yeah, um, the actual uh, like sh- what's it called, a shunt or the actual thing. They so what they do is they put it in your nostril down into your stomach, yeah, um, which yeah. is actually difficult to do. Um, the one they used for him um, is about as thick as your pinky. Yeah. Um, the ones they used in Guantanamo with all those force feeding, um, um, with all the reporting that came out of that. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. Um, those were about half the size. Um, so they're shoving this freaking massive tube. Like, look at the size of your pinky. That's going in your nose, down to your stomach. Jesus. Um, and it's hard to do. It's really hard to do. So he's, they have to get him to like comply. They have him like sipping on water. No nurses? 
No trained two. nurses. There are two nurses. Two, two nurses. Uh, one who identifies herself as a doctor. Um, but they're, yeah, I getting so into a like doctor and a nurse. Yeah, it's it's unclear whether the lady actually was a doctor. There was something in this article where may, maybe they were just two ice nurses. Um, but it's a little unclear. She could be a PhD nurse. That gets confusing. They fight for the right to be called doctor in hospital. She could be, which is fucking insane. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it 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 actually does a disservice to all the female doctors. It's like uh, you know, because female doc- women doctors are like uh, yeah, it just it sucks because uh. 20 years in, people still call me nurse. And I'm like, oh, yeah, but uh, the nurse over there, they call her doctor. I she has a PhD. I had no idea about yeah, that. Yeah, figure, yeah. Interesting. They're just confusing it for everybody. No, just be a nurse. Yeah. Yeah. More and more nurses are doing like everything in the hospital, though, so I get why they're pushing the, for, the underlying yeah. The underlying theme here is Eli's wife is going to be a nurse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, <laughs> there's no shame in it. It's just like, why are we confusing everybody? It's There's an academic There's like a rank. cultural diminutive connotation to nurses. There is. I know, but it's a, it's a hospital rank, so people know who can do what. Oh, when, no, I when know. When you go to yeah. the school, then you're doctor. Fair. But if she's a nurse and she's administering this and saying I'm a doctor to an immigrant, that guy is going to probably give consent of some right. kind based on that. Right, 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 right. It's horseshit. Okay, it's I get crazy. your point. Now, I get so your I point. hope yeah. that she was really a doctor, a medical doctor. That's yeah. what I'm saying. No, I get your point. Yeah, I mean, But also, I, I love your wife, and <laughs> nurses shouldn't be called doctors inside a hospital. Sorry. Fair, fair. Right. Another point that I should have mentioned at the top is he um, wasn't able to communicate with these people around him who were doing yeah. this. There was an interpreter on the phone at the very beginning yeah. who explained to him what was about to happen. Um, so this begins and, uh, it's not easy to put these in. Um, so they try in his left nostril first. Um, he talks about feeling it like tearing his, um, you know, the back of his throat. I bet it did. He's spitting up blood, um, like blood's coming out of his nose and, you know, he's turning and like throwing up blood into this bucket. How many peanut butter bites are you in by this point? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this is happening by the way. I hope you enjoyed your first experience of fucking peanut butter bites. What the fuck they were? Uncrustables, <laughs> Uncrustables. please. Uncrustables. Yeah, they're freaking delicious. Um, not so much in there. Americans love being comfortable. You know what? I'm going to watch this uh, video of <laughs> yeah. George. I'm going to have some fucking Uncrustables. <laughs> um, Are you done with those Uncrustables, buddy? No, not yet. No, not I've yet. seen worse while eating. I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I had to slow the video down yeah. to like 0.5 speed because I wanted to make sure I still had entertainment while I was finishing the end of, course, of it, you know, because yeah, I don't want to be course. eating without entertainment Yeah, in that's front of, of me. course. Yeah. This is the American uh, way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the bulk of this, the bulk <laughs> of this video. Um, He's just joking. This is a joke. Just joking. This is a yeah. joke. We're just, yeah. we're trying to deal with this horrible, if we just talked about this horrible subject matter straight through. Just immigration on its own is like pretty horrible and boring. You'd never listen. We're talking about something particularly horrible. And I feel the need to break the tension with jokes, which I get can be distracting. But also, I think for the majority of people, it's going to make this more palatable. And uh, we started off by talking about the fact that Eli ate crustables for the first time while putting this video on. Uncrustables. 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 I'm sorry. (laughs) Uncrustables. Uh, and uh, it's just it's just crazy. It's just crazy to yeah. keep eating those while this is happening. So go on, tell me about how they shove more things down his throat while you're eating Uncrustables. Yeah, I mean, it's actually not that much of a stretch uh, to bring humor into this because this, this type of shit makes me, gives me the type of rage that can only be really expressed in, in laughter. You know, it's just so freaking Or a Sam Kinison voice. Or a Sam Kinison voice. You're killing him! <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so yeah, the bulk of this video is yeah. this freaking, I, I don't know if they're hacks. They looked like hacks. Maybe it's because they were trying to shove like a garden nose sized thing down his nose. Um, they can't do it the first time. They don't get it in the right place. Uh, they pull it out. They try a second time in the same nostril. Like this guy is like arch, you know, back arched in pain, like completely, 
uh, you know, convulsing in pain, throwing up blood out of the, you know, to one side. Um, doesn't work a second time, so they rip this thing back out of his oh, nose, Jesus and then Christ, and then it takes the third time in the other nostril. They finally get this thing in, um, and there's just there's no other way to watch this video and and not look at it and call it torture. It is just the most blatant. Fuck, just listening to that is torture. Are you kidding me? It's it's one of the most difficult uh, videos I've ever watched. It's just ab. Absolutely fucking horrific. Uncrustables, five ninety nine at your local Kroger. One thirty nine on GoPuff. One thirty nine on GoPuff. Yeah. Eat Uncrustables. <laughs> you can get through anything. Yeah. If you'd like your own Uncrustables, go to uncrustables dot com slash Frontera Tech Podcast <laughs> slash ouchies slash it doesn't matter. <laughs> you have Uncrustables dot com and get ten percent off. <laughs> Just put in ICE TORTURE as your coupon code. That's ICE, ICE TORTURE 2023. Get 10% off. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, some of the most horrific shit I've ever watched in my entire life. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, the rest of the article dives in pretty deeply. Um, this A lot of this uh, reporting is coming from The Intercept, by the mm-hmm, way. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And a lot of it just goes into how prevalent this is. This shit happens mm-hmm, all the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I think, let's see, in 2018, there were a total of 25 hunger strikes in this, uh, in this one El Paso center. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a pretty common practice. Um, and then just in general in federal facilities, like I was saying in the beginning, um, it's totally across the aisle, Democrat, Republican, um, doesn't matter. It's, just, it's a very... Um, commonly used tactic in in all of federal detention let's end that here and just agree that this sort of horrible thing is happening inside of the gate yeah. of the united states yeah okay and it's something that we bring these stories up to light so that you're aware that they're not uncommon right right yeah. right i just want to touch on why we picked kalpana chavla okay she yeah. was uh an Indian American hero. Yeah. First, uh, Indian, I think astronaut, that's Indian woman in space. And definitely the first Indian woman. I'm actually not sure if there are are other Indian. And she dies in 2003. The reason that, um, I want to highlight her is that, uh, she brought so, she brought so much prestige to the United States. She was the face of, this is what happens when we, you know, 15 years after, you know, we've opened up the gates, 20 years after we opened up the gates of the United States to basically like non-European migrants. Yeah. Here's the benefit of that. We get the genius of the entire world. Here's a woman who, you know, invented and controlled robotic arms that pulled things out of space. Um, you said to me before the show, she was 90 pounds. She couldn't even get into an astronaut suit. Her story is incredible. Yeah. Five feet tall, 90 pounds. She never had her own suit because they, uh, she was too small for an astronaut suit. She's, she's a, she's a, she's a bona fide superstar hero in India where after her death in 2003 in the Challenger explosion, she had schools named after her institutes, streets, parts of cities. Um, but to me, she is what happens to the United States when we get uncomfortable, mm. right? The history yeah. of the immigration acts that allowed our system to open up to the entire world, right? Basically to the non-white world is fascinating. Yeah. It was a bitter fought battle and it required America to be uncomfortable and it changed the face of America. It really did. Yep. Okay. Yep. And part of that is we became even better. We became even better. And so we'll post some links to her story on this podcast. Thank you all for watching. Eli, thank you for just putting together this episode. And um, as you're sitting at home, think about how you can be less comfortable and whether all the comfort that you're enjoying actually makes you happy. You might find out that it doesn't. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.